And he said, let there be light. And there was. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Do you know, we, we're going to have a little movie tonight. I, actually, I've got, a, I've got a word to bring comfort to people. G'day Zoomers, and there's people out there who are Zooming who need comfort. There are people there that have come in tonight, you may need some comfort also, but all I want to do, I want to share tonight where we are in, in time, in the things of God, where we stand today. I think it's really important God's people understand where we are, because it's a time of preparation and looking up. It's a time to prepare your hearts and look up. You know, we don't know the time or the place, but we do know that we have to have this expectation in our heart. We're going to meet with him. He's coming. He's coming and he's coming quickly. And there are certain signs that we can look at. But I, I want to build your faith first. <clears throat> Yesterday we were sharing... So I get in front of this camera. Yesterday we were sharing um, about looking up about having hope in what the Word of God says. The Word of God is truth. Okay, everything pales in comparison to what the Word of God says. It's His promise. The one thing God can't do is lie, and His Word is His full truth. If you read the Bible in one year, everything He has thought about concerning your salvation is in that book. Every thought relating to your salvation is in that book. Every thought he has towards you is in that book. And you've got to dig for it sometimes. Sometimes it's not plainly on the surface. When you start reading, it starts to jump out at you. And I want to share some things tonight, but before that, <coughs> I want to just show you a video, or a couple of videos, of what happens when a man of God sets himself to follow God. You want to see that? Yes. And the results that come from it. Switch that light, the light off again. No. You're all awake now. Hey? You're all awake. I know. <laughs> I can't help it. <coughs> we're, we're, not, we're not having technical difficulties. Difficulties? Um, it'll come, don't worry. Yeah, there we go. Now it's coming up. Okay, switch the lights off so you can see it, but it's a bit graphic. Sometimes you need it graphic, don't you? <laughs> Amen. That's the power of God. That is the power of God. Actually, that um, channel is uh, the man in the synagogue in Nigeria. He's a true prophet of God. This guy, I saw him ministering in Sydney at Blacktown. If people would you just pick them out of the crowd, you tell them what they've been doing and, and set them free. That, that's nothing. I've got to tell you that we were trying to find one. There was a dead baby in a lady's womb. She'd been to the hospital and uh, she ended up with um, the baby died in her, in her womb. And um, septicemia was setting in. The doctors wanted to get the baby out of the birth canal because they were worried about septicemia. And she said, no. She said, get me to that synagogue. Now the road in, alongside the synagogue is a public road. It's actually close to the public now. It's actually their parking lot where they can just bring in ambulances and constantly a flow of people coming through. <coughs> the, um, she got in the taxi. She laid in the back seat. The taxi drove her to this place, and, and you, you can dig this up on the net and you'll see it. The, the visibility of it is mind-blowing. Um, she turns up, it's not, not now, Pete, sorry. She turns up at, this, at the hospital, and the cameras are full on her. And they open up the, the door, and there she is laying in the back seat, and in the ride, the baby has come out from the birth canal, and is lying on the seat, the back seat, green like a piece of cabbage. It looks like a cabbage loaf. It doesn't look like a baby. All right? It's, it, the baby, septicemia has set in, the baby is green. <coughs> they have nurses at the roadside entrance 
who check the people and a doctor who check the people as they come in because they write those pages to say what the verdict is. They come in with their, their doctor's things and they have a doctor in the church who checks them out. And so what happens, uh, the nurses they come running out, they saw the baby, the umbilical cord is still attached, so they come and they cut the umbilical cord, pick up the baby and smack it to try to make it cry. You think they were beating it, <laughs> you know, with the with the force that they were smacking it, and nothing was happening. And she's in the back, and she's almost out of it. And she's saying, "Please, just get the man to pray for her." Now he's got a ruling that when he's in the prayer closet with the Lord, he's not to be disturbed. That's where he spends time to find what's happening. That's why we're fasting at the moment. I've got to tell you, one of the reasons we're fasting is to learn to get in that place in the closet. And, and to allow the anointing to come through. She, <clears throat> one of the nurses just runs up to the upper room where he's praying and braves his wrath because he, he gets angry with them, right? And she knocked on the door, she said, there's a baby down there who's dead, the lady's in the car, and he goes off at her, he says, didn't I tell you not to bother me? And he says, here, yeah. and he's writing out his sermon notes. Go and lay this on the baby. <laughs> so the nurse comes running out and it looks like she's got fish and chip paper. <laughs> right? But she touches the baby who's still, like they've laid the baby on the seat. They touch the baby and you'll see this. And you can't do this. But you see this baby where it's green, all of a sudden it starts becoming red and life comes and it, start, it just comes and all of a sudden the baby starts crying. It's, it just comes back to life. Uh, uh, you want to see the power of God in some of these miracles, you want to G up your own faith, you want to look at some of this stuff because this is the God we serve. All right? But that's a man who set his life apart to get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what he's doing. That, why I'm asking you to pray Years ago, here in this place, we had through the night prayer. Who, who was a part of that? Ricky, myself, I think, she, were you here? Chester was here at the time. Actually, a lot of you are all new compared to those days. We had through the night prayer, and every one of us in this church took a three hour watch. And it kept going continually for 18 months. But it changed this coast. And I'm not boasting, I just know that this coast was different. You know, the anointing of God. People would come onto this coast and they'd sense the lightness in the place. And all I know, I shared last week what happened when we started fasting one day on, one day off. Did, we, did you all hear that preach? We, we ended up in Melbourne and we saw what happened when a lady's leg just grew almost a foot. Just shot down. The foot was on the end of this leg, it just shot down. She had polio, one leg was so much shorter than the other. And she had a frame that she would step on to, get, to build a hide up. And, uh, and she got healed. Her arms had been pinned to her sides from polio and she was praising God that day. I mean, it, just, it happened like that. Now, I, I, I remember a girl who had manager cockle. I was sharing this with someone the other day. Um, she was a, a worship leader at Bethesda. Her name was Liz, I'm just trying to think of his last name. Her father was the Bible college pastor at Bethesda. And Dickerson, her name was Lizzie Dickerson. Do you ever remember Lizzie Dickerson? She was a beautiful young blonde girl about 21 years old and um, one day she contracted meningococcal disease. Do you know what meningococcal is? Two days and you're dead. <laughs> there were about half a dozen people contracted that disease at the time. She's the only survivor. Wow. She was on, on her deathbed. They had two nurses around the clock uh, looking after her. And the Lord spoke in my heart. Someone said to me, can you go please pray for her? And I said, what am I going to do? Like my faith level is in the dirt. <laughs> All right? But I, I prayed to the Lord and I said, Father, you've got an answer. 
And this word came to me, and th that reminded me today. This word came to me, juju. Now, I didn't know what juju was, okay? To me, juju sounded like a lolly. <laughs> but that's the word that God gave me. And uh, I was going down to Adelaide, there was a conference on from certain Argentinian guys. So I was going down there anyway, and I thought, okay, juju, I'll go and see this girl. I don't know what this word is going to do, but I know God's given me that word. And as I'm driving down, I'm driving down with Daryl Delaney. Now, if you people don't know Daryl Delaney. He used to work at um, Belly's. He used to come here to church. And Daryl was a Bible teacher and a pretty learned man. And as we're driving, I said, Daryl, I said, do you know what juju means? He said, oh, he said, let me think. He said, uh, yes, he said, it's a South American curse. Right? Clear as a bell. And I said, well, that's where we're going to set this girl free. She's been cursed with the South American curse. That lady that you just saw healed was cursed. That's what was, came out of her mouth. And we've seen that happen in deliverances quite a lot. People, the church gets a messy place when people start getting delivered sometimes, okay? So you, know, you shouldn't be phased by this stuff. In Africa, it's in the raw, you know, like... Yeah, they're naked, they're naked, who cares? We're all naked, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, that's not the connotation there. They want healing, they come to Christ, they come the way they are. And um, all I remember is that when I went in, into this hospital, St Andrew's Hospital it was, the father was in the waiting room outside the, um, um, what the, what's the intensive care place. And they had two nurses on this girl. And she was laying on a silver slab, a, a, a stainless steel slab, and she was out of it. They didn't expect to see the night out, uh, and they were pumping her full of um, adrenaline to get her moving, just to keep her organs going. She was turning blue, the blood was pouring out and coming through her skin. And. Um, he was out there and, and when he saw me come in, I had had a word for him years before. So accurate it changed his ministry. God had spoken to me about something that was happening in his life and had to change in him. So when I came in, he, he looked up and hope came into his heart. He said he remembered the word that came through our ministry before. He said, what are you doing? I said, someone asked me to come pray for your daughter and I said, I think I know what the problem is. I said, but you're going to have to help me. I've, I know what God's spoken to me. I know now what it means because on the way down, Daryl was able to explain what that word means. And I said, there's a curse on your daughter and it's a South American curse. And he goes, oh my God. He said, on Saturday she broke up with her Argentinian boyfriend. All right? Now, South American people can move in witchcraft, same as African people, same as Asian people. In most countries, they have, the occult is at work as much as Christianity is at work in some of those places. And so, um, we went in. They, they gowned us up. And I went to the girl and I, I grabbed her hand and uh, I said, can you hear me? No response. I said, if you can, squeeze my hand. She squeezed my hand. And I said, we've got to break the soul ties between you and your boyfriend and I'm going to break the power of the curse. I said, so just agree with me. If, even if you can't speak it out, agree with me. The soul ties are being cut off today by the blood of Jesus. And the curse is being broken right now in Jesus' name. You'll be out of here shortly. And I left her. And I, I, I came out, he was as happy as he knew something had happened. I went to the conference, there he was dancing in the mosh pit. <laughs> the father, you know, like he had a joy in his heart. And I never heard, I heard she came out, I heard she came out the very next day she was out of that hospital. And um, I, I hadn't heard until about a year later when I was walking down with Bruce Miller, my, my first pastor, down the mall in Marion. And this young, beautiful girl grabbed me by the, by the uh, shirt, pulled me back, and Denise is going, what is happening there? <laughs> and, and she pulled me back and she said, Raf, sure. I said, yeah. And she said, don't you know who I am? And I'm looking at her 
And I'm thinking, hang on, that's that worship leader from Bethesda. I said, Liz, is that you? She said, yeah. I didn't recognise her. She was, you know, she was absolutely, looked absolutely stunningly beautiful. And she said, I want to thank you. She said, that day you walked in, she said, um, the light walked in with you. <laughs> that's all she remembered. The light walked in with you. And I was set free. Jesus walked in with me. And Jesus walks in with you wherever you go. You better remember that. He walks in with you. You may not be aware he's there all the time. He needs you to work in the words of knowledge. He needs you to get into that place where you can hear. And this fasting is going to draw you into that place. That's where you're heading. As tough as it is, you're going to be... <laughs> and it's tough enough. I know, it's tough for all of us. Who's, who's been fasting the last week? Is it changing something on the inside of you? I want, to show, I, want to, I want to explain to you why, why that's happening. God declares your body is dead to sin. Do you know, so most people think that we just sit there and it falls on us, you know, and it doesn't. There's a discipline that's got to come into your life for you to keep walking with God. You've got to overcome yourself. Your greatest enemy is you. The devil is your enemy. But your carnality is your greatest enemy. No, I don't want to get out of bed. No, I know I want to eat. <laughs> your body has got a voice. Your spirit has a voice. One of them is in ascendancy to the other. When we first come into the kingdom, your body has more say than your spirit. You're skinny in the spirit. But when you're born again, your spirit starts to grow like a gorilla. And the discipline you bring into your life will grow your spirit. When you fast, you're pulling your body into gear. You're pulling it down. At the same time you pray in the spirit, you are building your spirit up. He says it's a gift to edify you. Edification is a building up. When you start doing this, your body's coming down, your spirit's going up. You're going to get to a place where you're going to have an awful battle. <laughs> a terrible battle. Because they're going to be level. They're equal strength. You hearing me? This is where most people give up praying in the spirit. They give up praying in the spirit. They give up. Don't give up. Keep your hope in him. Keep looking up to him because when you're praying in the spirit, you are going to build your spirit way past your flesh. That's when you start coming in to the place where every prayer is starting to get answered. Every prayer you utter, and you think you've just come to some new move of God. No, you are growing to the place where Jesus can now start speaking to you and you can start taking authority over things. That's why it's so important that you learn to discipline yourself. And the only way I know, the narrow track he's taught me, and the Holy Spirit has taught me this, is to put my body out of the way so my spirit can get, gain ascendancy. So my spirit can grow. That's what you're seeing in that thing. That man sets his heart before the Lord. Every man of God that I know who moves in the power of God has always had to put their flesh out of the way. David Hogan in Mexico has raised over 230 people from the dead. You know what his habit is? He gets up at 4 o'clock every morning and spends the time with the Lord before the day starts. That's his fast. He fasts his sleep. You can fast food, you can fast your sleep, you can do them alternately. I, I remember when I first read this that David spoke to his soul and commanded his soul what to do. David spoke to his soul and commanded it what to do. And he said this, at the threshing floor of Onan, when they were bringing the cart back from the Philistine country where it had been taken capture by the Philistines. And two priests were walking along and one touched it because the, the, it was on a cart. It was on a cart and when the priest touched it, his name was Yuza. And he touched it and he dropped dead because he touched the cart. He touched the presence of God. And it scared David. It scared him. 
And he had to go back for three months. It scared him, but there was a priest called Obed Edom who lived on that bend of the threshing floor and he took the card in because he was someone that ministered in the, in the temple. And so he looked after it and his house was so blessed for three months that David heard about it and said, no, that blessing belongs to us, to Jerusalem. <coughs> he brought that priest with him. He became one of the chief musicians. There's a go. <laughs> he knew how to worship God, that opened at him. Praise God. He brought, him, he brought him into the temple. He had to learn how to handle the presence of God, which is what we do. When we fast, God deals with us. And we learn, he does. And we learn to handle the presence of the living God. He deals with us. That's, that's all the stuff we're going through. Tribulation. He doesn't tell you you're not going to go through tribulation. He says you are. Every one of us will, in some part of our life, sense tribulation. But he does promise this, that he will bring us out of tribulation. That's the promise of God. That's the promise of the miraculous in your life. Whatever you're going through, you're going to prove God. You're going to prove God lives. He lives today. And people will know it. People will know it. And this isn't for priests. This is for every born again believer from the littlest kid to the oldest person if they set their hearts to give their lives to God I've got to tell you do not give up there's a condition on our salvation most people don't realise this and that is to keep going keep on going in God keep looking up it's a discipline <clears throat> it's a discipline Praise God. I, I never forget what that girl said. She said, I saw the light come in. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't feel anything, but I didn't know what to do because he spoke to me. And I know that that's the place we've got to be. We're vessels. And he says we're vessels for honour and for ignoble purposes in the kingdom. All of us. There are vessels for honour in this place. There are vessels who are dealing with the ignoble things in their lives to become vessels of honour. It's a growing thing. It's a growing in the things of God. And I've got to tell you, right now at this time, we're in a place that the Bible calls the beginning of sorrows. Do you realise that? I'll read it to you. It's sobering. But we're, we're going in a direction where God wants to start using us. In, the, in Matthew 24, that's just the start of Matthew 24. <clears throat> Jesus answered, 24.4, Jesus answered, now everything in red in this Bible is the words of Jesus Christ. They're not my words and they're not anybody else's, they're his, okay? And he says this, he says, take heed that no one deceives you. You know, you can see things like that. There are, there are films that we see and there are things that happen. You're going to hear in the world people who raise up as prophets of God. They're going to be false prophets, okay? There are true prophets and there are false prophets. You will know the prophetic by their things coming to pass. Remember in Egypt there were magicians and there was Moses. And there were two stars thrown down and there was another one. Not everybody who says they're hearing God is hearing God. You've got to see the proof of their hearing God. That's the proof in the pudding. Okay? Not their airy fairy thinking, but hearing him. Hearing exactly what he's saying and knowing that it's God. And there are people who spend time with him who have sorted out who, what God is when they speak what their voice is or what the voice of the enemy is. They have spent time learning to discern the difference in the voices because there are plenty of voices out there. Many, many prophets have gone astray listening to the wrong voice. A.A. A. Allen had a fantastic ministry. Who was the other guy? They started a whole movement, the Branham, Branham movement, right? Fantastic prophet of God went astray. 
And I want to tell you, there are spirits out there who can take people astray. If it happens to these people, it can happen to any of us. So we have to be at a place where we are sure that it's God speaking through us. All the airy fairy, I've got to tell you, I can't stand airy fairy prophecy. I just, I just think it muddies the water and when people come in they don't see the truth, they see something that some spirit has taken over the person. I, I, you know, when people are looking at clouds and they're looking at shapes and they're looking at flowers, that's okay, but that's their imagination most of the time. But I want to tell you, when God speaks to you, he speaks in that small inner voice. When you're born again, you know you're born again. He's talked to you, don't you? You know. He speaks to you. And you know, without a doubt, he's told you to go and do something. I was talking to a brother tonight, and he was saying how he heard to go and see a man of God to do something. Is that correct? And, that, and that's, you know that you know. With God, that's the test. You'll know. <laughs> You won't doubt. When someone comes to me and they say, oh, I think God said this to me, brother. You know my answer to them? Go and think again. Because if you're not sure, it's not God. Go and think again. If you come to me and tell me God spoke to you, you better be sure that you're saying God has spoken to me. And I'll believe you. Because there's no doubt. But when you think God's spoken to you, shut up. You're muddying water. Keep it yourself. Amen? Rule of, the pro of prophecy. That's one of them. One of the main ones. If you're not sure, don't speak. Every time you hear prophecy come out of your mouth, it will glorify Jesus Christ and nothing else. Amen? Too many self-made prophets believe that they're the ones that got to bring law and order to the church. Well, I've got to tell you, God will raise up the true prophets and when you see that, it'll, the others will pale in significance because that's what he's doing right now. We're in the time of sorrows where he's developing the church, the church that's rising up. Let me keep reading this to you. It's not good, but the outcome is fantastic. Okay, The outcome is that a remnant is being raised up by God. You know, a lot of the old men of God this last two years have been taken home. Men who've led the church prophetically have been taken home. Who was, who was the guy who was a salvationist in, in the States and then his son followed him? Jensen uh, Franklin. Franklin, his dad. He was a leader. He was a statesman in the kingdom, that man. He was a man of the word. He had a ticket for heaven. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you're not troubled. Did you hear that? Did you hear me? See that you're not troubled. You need the peace of God in your life. And you'll find that in that time with him in the closet. Fasting and praying. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Say that, the end is not yet. I don't care what you hear prophesied around the place, the end is not yet. There's a systematic system in what I'm about to read you that'll show you when the end is closer. Amen? So read, read this. You hear of wars and rumours of wars, see you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. Praise God. I was just writing some stuff. Praise God. Wars, natural disasters. No, I'll just keep reading it. Wars, famines, earthquakes. Wars, famines, earthquakes. Are we seeing that at the moment? Yeah. Are we? Yes. You sure? <laughs> just got to read the newspaper every morning. Wars, famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. 
That's what they are. They're the beginning of sorrows. Do you know what sorrows means in this particular context? It means birth pangs, a birthing. God is birthing something. The world has become, come to the place that the church is going to be birthed out of all these birth pangs. Out of these sorrows that are coming, the church is going to be birthed. It's going to become a light to the world. It is a light already, but I want to tell you it's going to shine. Those miracles are going to be second nature to us. Do you understand that? You're going to be walking in the power of God. There's something going to be birthed on the church. The anointing that's coming on the church is going to be incredibly powerful. And we're being prepared for that. All these are the beginning of, of, of sorrows. Then, say then. Then. Do you know, whenever you see that word in the Bible, it means there's a systematic thing happening. This is happening, then you're going to see this. Then you're going to see that. Then you're going to see the next thing. So there's an order in what he's showing us here. And he's saying this, he says, then they'll deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. That's not very good, is it? <laughs> you're going to need to get to raising the dead then. <laughs> <laughs> then they're going to deliver you up to the tribulation and they'll kill you you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake and then here's another then many will be offended they'll betray one another and will hate one another you know why they'll do that this is Christians he's talking about when he speaks of the you all these at the beginning he's talking about us this Bible is written for born-again Christian believers. Do you realise that? People who have had the veil lifted off their eyes. He says, then many will be offended. They'll betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. That's just what I was sharing with you a second ago. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. What are you seeing in the States at the moment? Lawlessness. Because of that lawlessness, you can actually make an equation out of that. Lawlessness is going to bring lovelessness. It'll grow cold. It'll grow cold. Because people will be hardened. They'll be complaining. Oh, this is happening and that's happening. Never lose hope in who we have. We have the Lord. Amen. Doesn't matter how impossible it looks out there, you've got Jesus in you. Amen? Amen? If you don't believe it, whack that thing on again. Let's show them what he can do. <laughs> Amen? That's the whole key. We carry Christ, the hope of glory. The whole world is waiting for the answer you have. The whole world is waiting to see what it is you've got on the inside of you. Are you a Christian or do you just mouth it off? It's important because people are looking at you. They're looking to see if we're fair dinkum. They're looking to see if we carry what we say we carry. And you can't get there without discipline in your life. I'm telling you, it will not fall on you. It will not fall on you. There's a disciplined life that brings it in. And that's, I believe that's where we're heading at the moment. I believe the path God has been quickening in my heart to ask you, this church had come into a place of fasting. We've called it a three-month fast. It sounds terrible, doesn't it? Every second day. I can't fast for three days. Forget three months. <laughs> I, find it, I find it really difficult to fast three days. But the Lord taught me years ago. He said, you, can't, you can fast every second day, Ralph. He said, you know, if you fasted for six months, you would have effectively fasted three months of the year. And you don't realise what that's doing. It's getting your flesh out of the way where I can teach you. And when you're doing that, your spirit can rise up and I can use you. Anybody want to be used by God? Yes. With power. Yes. The Bible's literal to me. The Bible is not an airy-fairy book. Every time I talk to people, I'm telling them, it's a history book telling you what happened. He did die. He was on the cross. He was born of a virgin. He did deliver people. He did heal them. You can see even he's still doing it today. But he's using us as ambassadors. He's using people as his arms and legs. He's come to live on the inside of them. 
that born again experience. What a privilege. You've been born again, your spirit's come alive to God and you're carrying the living God and he says, don't be anxious when these things are happening. You are the answer. You have the answer on the inside of you. Amen? Amen. Jesus speaks five features showing events that are coming with this sorrow that we're seeing in the world at the moment. He says there will be wars, famines, earthquakes and pestilence. There'll be worldwide rejection of Christians. It's already started. Have you noticed? <laughs> It's getting harder and harder for Christians to do the Christian thing, just to worship today. We're fortunate in this country that we have had such freedom for so long. Amen? Running out of battery? Mate, I'm a rip bag. How much we got there, bub? 20%. How much? 20%? Okay, I'm going to give you three more minutes then. <laughs> Try to get the message out. There's going to be an apostasy, the third thing, and betrayal among Christians. Do you hear me? A falling away and a betrayal amongst Christians. Praise God. Why? Actually, that's a good question, isn't it? Why is that going to happen? Because they're going to want to save their own lives. I was talking to Denise the other day. I'm saying, you know, a lot of this COVID stuff, there's, a, there's a, something deeper going on. They're ushering in something more deeply into the world at the moment. You know, there have been as many deaths by the flu over the years as there had been this COVID. And we've never panicked like this before. <laughs> it hasn't shut down finance and it hasn't shut down the homes. But this thing is being contrived worldwide. There's a force behind it and I believe it's the devil. Amen? So... He's bringing the past, it's in time, he's panicking, his time's coming up. There'll be false prophets with cults, so be aware. You know, this place here, we used to get called a cult when we first started it here. You know why? Because they were frightened of the power of God. We, used to, we, used to, we walked in a very, very powerful anointing, and it's waned over the years, but it's all about to come back. He's given us a taste of the end times. We've seen incredible healings and deliverances and salvations. But I want to tell you what this place has been set up as. It's an end time refuge. And the Lord told me to get on with it while I was teaching about the Holy Spirit in Newcastle with the YWAM. He sent a message from Melbourne, a prophet in Melbourne that never met medicine in his life before. His brother-in-law was the head of the YWAM base and he, this man had flown up, which was his brother-in-law, he runs a church in Melbourne and his prophet was working in a shed and he, he just got introduced to me, this brother-in-law from Melbourne. He said, oh my God, he said, just stop there, will you? And he hands me his phone, he says, this is the prophet in my church. He's fixing timber up. He said, this is for you. And there on the message is, I'm doing some work in my shed and the Lord stopped me to phone you to tell you that the man standing in front of you at the moment with a moustache, I didn't have a beard then, okay? I just had a moustache. He said, God wants him to know, get on with it. <laughs> and he just finished giving me all the material for this shed. So we started building urgently and doing the kitchen and doing the outside. Now he's putting on my heart to make sure that we've fenced it so we've got sheep for meat and we're growing gardens in the place. We've just bought a tractor to start, to start building potato patches and, and cucumber, not cucumber, um, pumpkins, just basic food. And I, I know it's going to serve the people of God. There have been visions spoken over this place of people coming for refuge. It's a town of refuge. Ramoth Gilead is exactly what that means. A place of refuge for God's people where they'll be fed in this time that's coming. And I know we're on that. I've heard clearly and that's set my heart to do this thing. And if I 
go up to be with the Lord tomorrow before all this comes to pass, then it will continue. We've said in the place that it will become a perpetual place for Jesus. My daughter will be running it. All my girls will be helping because I know the vision God's put in our hearts and they will make sure it stays in Christian hands. Isn't that right? That's exactly where it's got to stay. This place has got to stay in Christian hands. Amen. He's given me bricky to work alongside of me to pastor with us. And he'll raise up pastors in the place. He, he loves not being a pastor, but he is. He's a brutal one sometimes, but that's the way. <laughs> that's, that's needed. Sometimes that's what's needed, okay? But I, that, I'm sharing this with you because at this time we are getting close and we need to set things in order. We need to tell you what the Lord's saying. He spoke to me, he said, Blessed is the man whom he finds giving the people the right bread at the right time. And the right bread is get close again, get close to God. Watch. He, in, that, in that scripture you'll find the word watch a number of times. It says, many false prophets will rise up because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures, say he who endures, endures. To, the end, to the end, shall be saved. Shall. You know you're saved now, but you've got to endure to stay saved. Right there. Right there. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So you've got to understand, it's not yet. Then, then, then. There's a systematic way of writing in this, or a systematic way of Jesus speaking. Every time you see the word then, he's saying, this will happen, then that, then that, and then that. Praise God. Amen. You know, there's two types of war when it speaks of war. There's political war and ethnic cleansing. One, World War I, World War II, political war. Do you know, in 1914, one million Christians were slain by Turks, the Armenians. Do you know that? They ended up escaping to Europe and America, the Armenians. But there was an ethnic cleansing of Christians in Turkey at the time. Same things happened in Asia. Spain, the civil war in Spain, ethnic cleansing. You know, there was prophecy coming to pass. Hatred towards Christians is going to start to become very rampant in the world. And you're going to see it. You're going to see it on the news. I remember in, in um, Indonesia, I was ministering throughout Indonesia and Malaysia, and at the time, Aceh. Can you remember Aceh, what was happening there? They had floods, they've had all this thing. But they killed Christian pastors, Muslims. They were playing football, they cut the pastors' heads off and they were playing football with their heads down the street and I saw movies of what they'd done to them. There's persecution coming. And you're going to need to be strong now when it's easy. <laughs> I mean, this is easy. I've got to tell you, none of us suffer hardship here. <laughs> None of us have got skin poisoning like that woman who's just been shown. It's easy. We're all going through different things. But he promises to bring us out of our tribulation. So don't lose hope. If you're crippled, do not lose hope. Have a look at that movie. If he can do it for them, he can do it for you. Amen? And he's still doing it today. I think we've had enough. I'm going to run out of battery in a second. So I'll just... Father... I thank you that if this is from you, this word today, that you would burn it into our hearts, Father, and teach us to discipline our lives, to hear your voice more clearly, to be led of the Spirit of God, to spend time watching, because as I continue reading the scripture, it says, Woe to those, let him who is in the field not go back for his clothes. And it speaks of the great tribulation. But it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect. Be ready. 
Watch means to pray. A watchman's watch is, a, is, a, is an early morning when he's watching, when the light's first coming up, before the sun comes up. He's watching. He's watching through the night. The night watches speak of our prayer lives. Amen. Father, I thank you you burn this word into our hearts tonight. All of us, not just a few of us, but all of us. Help us to discipline our lives, to say no to the things we need to say no to and say yes to the things you want in our lives. To say yes that Father God, even though we're going through a hard time, that you will help us come through. You will never let us suffer to the point where you won't give us a door to relieve that, Lord. Your word says that. You'll always show us a way through. Always show us a way through. Amen. Amen. Keep us in your word, Lord. Keep us holy. Keep us faithful. Keep us in line with your word, Lord. And where we've failed in the past, grant us repentance, Father, that the doors would be closed that have been holding us back. In Jesus' name. Amen. And all the saints said, I think that concludes tonight. God bless you. Thank you, Father.